Today's scripture will be read from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. Again, that's Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census, census first took place while Quirinus was governing Syria. So all went out to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which was called Bethlehem because was the house because he was of the house of and lineage of David to be registered registered with Mary his betrothed wife who was with child so it was that while they were there the days were completed for her to be delivered and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over the flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who the Christ the Lord, who is, yeah, who is the Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them in, into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they see he had now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who had heard it marveled at those things which were told to them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that, had, that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. Good morning. Good morning. For those of you who uh, woke up early, stay awake. Uh, and for those uh, children maybe who are uh, hotly anticipating getting home to uh, play with maybe some new things that you got this morning, or maybe there's some parents out here that are crazy enough that they haven't even opened presents yet, uh, just hang with me and we'll, uh, we'll get through this. Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, there are shepherds out in the middle of the field at night and they're, they're watching over their sheep as shepherds would do. That's their job to guard against enemies that might come in, guard against wolves or, or other animals of prey. Perhaps it would come in and devour the sheep. And in the middle of, you can, you can imagine, you can picture it in your mind, the, the flock laying perhaps down in the, the grass around them, perhaps with the, the moon shining down. In the middle of this, as, as I picture in my mind, the shepherds lean up, leaning back upon a, a tree or, or someplace comfortable where they can kind of keep their eyes on the sheep, but also kind of get a little bit of rest. We see in verses 10 and 11, it says this, But the angel said to them, the angel appears to them and says, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Your version might say, Behold, today there is born to you a Messiah. 
A Messiah. What does that word Messiah mean? The Messiah is the promise, the long promised and the long awaited Savior, the deliverer of Israel, but really the deliverer of mankind. This morning there are many folks that are uh, recognizing and appreciating Christ the Lord and His, his birth. And, and we want to take the, the time to do that and, and point out a, a few things. First of all, we want to look at the prophecies of this coming Messiah. We also want to notice the, the praise that is given to this promised Messiah. The promise that this Messiah fulfills. And finally, what was the purpose of this Messiah who came to the earth? Let's look first of all at the promise. The signs... Were clear the prophecies of this coming Messiah. Here, here are just a, a small listing of some of the things that were prophesied. And what does it mean to prophesy? That means before it happened, there was someone who said, this is going to happen. And they were talking about Jesus. They were talking about the Messiah. It was prophesied where he would be born. How he would be born. He would be born of a virgin. What tribe he would be a part of, a, tribe, a part of the tribe of Judah. It was prophesied that he would spend time in Egypt as a young child. That he would grow up in Nazareth. That he would spend much time in Galilee. That he would be betrayed, crucified. That his clothes would be gambled for while he was being crucified. That his body might be broken, but his bones would not be broken. He'd be buried with the rich, resurrected. He would ascend, and he would seat, be seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You could say that before before Jesus was born, as a matter of fact, we can say, before Jesus was born, the entirety of Jesus' story was told, even before he was born, before he took his first breath out of the womb, we would know it was promised about what would happen and what Jesus would do. It is these prophecies and the, the scriptures that are found in the Old Testament about these prophecies that the, the earliest Christians studied those because they didn't have the, the New Testament like you and I have. They didn't have the Gospel of Luke that told them about the birth of Jesus. No, they had these prophecies of the Old Testament that would tell them, here is what this Messiah, the one who's going to come and going to deliver you, going to save you from your sins, here is what he is going to do. And these earliest Christians in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when people first become Christians, Christians, it's the prophecies that point to Jesus that lead them to becoming Christians. And in Acts chapter 8, we read the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. Here's a man who's, who's not Jewish. He, he's from Ethiopia and Africa, and he's traveled all the way to Jerusalem to, to study and to, to worship God. And he's reading in the book of Isaiah, an Old Testament book, and he's reading a prophecy about Jesus. And Philip, who's a Christian, comes to him and he says, it says in the scripture, from that verse he taught to him Jesus. There were prophecies made thousands of years before Jesus came that he would come. And not only would he come, but exactly everything that he would do and what his purpose would be. Again, this morning, uh, around the world, there are, are people who claim the name of Christ who are praising the birth of Christ. But let's notice who first Praise the birth of Christ. Look back to Luke chapter 2. And let's read verses 13 and 14 and then verse 20. Luke 2, 13 and 14 and then verse 20. It says, And suddenly there appeared with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom He is pleased. Who is it that first of all praised the birth of Christ? Well, first of all, angels and a host of heavenly beings. God... And his heavenly host were excited, were praising the fact that Jesus, God's Son, God in the flesh, was finally born. We'll talk more about this, but the, the reason that he's excited about this is because God has, has long promised this. And now, with the birth of Christ, this is the very beginning of the fulfillment of the ultimate promise. Notice verse 20. The shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen just as they had been told. Now they had been told and, and, and seen some, some things that would happen in the future. But, but what is it that they are most immediately thankful for and praising about? The newborn babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger. They're excited. They're praising God for the fact that Jesus was born. They'll also go on as, as uh, it's Jewish custom that uh, Jewish boys would be uh, circumcised on the eighth day in Luke chapter 2 verses 27 and following. Read about a, a man named Simeon. He's, he's an old man. He's, he's an old priest and he's been working in the, the temple for a long time. And, and it was told to him that before he died, he would see the salvation 
of his people. He would see the Messiah born, and he praises God when that happens. And later on in the verse, we see a, a, a woman named Anna, and she is a, a servant who, who serves in the temple, and she also praises God. She's, she's lived in the temple basically her entire adult life. She, she was married to her husband for a short time, but after he died, she dedicated herself to the temple. She dedicated herself to the, the worship of God and the, the things that would need to be done, the, the work of God. And it says that day and night she served in the temple. And she comes about in verses 36 through 38. Notice what it says about her. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then as a widow to the age of 84, she never left the temple, serving night and day with fasting and prayers. At that very moment, the moment when Jesus has come into the temple, at that very moment she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak to Him, to speak of Him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. So here, Simeon and Anna, who, who are looking for it and, and longing for it, and all these, these Jewish folks should have been looking and longing for this coming Messiah. Simeon and Anna, they recognize this is what we've been waiting for. This, for Simeon, was what was promised that would come before his death. And they praise God for the fact that they were able to see the birth of Christ. Let me suggest to you that you and I should celebrate the birth of Christ. Not necessarily on December 25th. Uh, we, we don't know when Jesus was born. We're not commanded to celebrate Jesus' birth at any certain point and any certain day. But we should celebrate. We should be excited. We should be enthusiastic about the fact that Jesus was born. Because without His birth, there would be no death. Without His death, there would be no resurrection. Without that, there would be no gospel, no saving message. And you would not be a Christian if Jesus had not been born of a virgin and laid in a manger. We should celebrate daily, every day. Be thankful for the fact of Christ's birth every day of our lives. We should celebrate the fact that God put on in John chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, it says, And the Word put on flesh and dwelt among us. Now, Jesus is God. Jesus put on flesh. And in Philippians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, it talks about this as well. Philippians 2, 7 and 8, it says, Jesus uh, emptied himself, is what most versions say. You could also say there, Jesus laid aside his privileges. Taking the form of a bondservant, made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being a, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. We need to celebrate. We need to daily be thankful for the fact that God put on flesh. All of us, I believe, if you're here this morning, you want to go to heaven. That's the place that you're trying to, to get. You live your life daily if you're a Christian, or you have told God that you'll live your life daily if you're a Christian. You're going to live your life today so that whenever your life ends, you can spend eternity with Him in heaven. That's where we're all trying to get. And He left that place to come here, a, pla a place of pain and turmoil and difficulty and death, not because we deserved it. We can, we can know ourselves and know that we didn't deserve that. We can look at the world around us and know that we didn't deserve that, but we can be thankful for the fact that Jesus put on flesh. We can be thankful for the fact that there was the fullness of God in helpless babe. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 9, it says, For in Him, that is Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Not just in bodily form. Jesus could have come perhaps as a, as a, a full grown man. He, he could have done that perhaps. Perhaps the, the will of God, the plan of God could have been fulfilled that way. But, but He chose for, for Jesus. God chose for Him to go through every aspect of life. Everything that you have ever experienced, Jesus in some way experienced that. And we can be thankful for the, that fact. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Let's read verses 14 and 15. This speaks to this, this idea that we can be thankful for the fact that Jesus has experienced the things that we have experienced. Hebrews 4, 14 and 15 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest, this is talking about Jesus, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Let's hold fast our confession. Why? For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Any temptation that you face, Jesus faced that same temptation. 
But thankfully, and praise God, he did not sin. Notice verse 16. Therefore, because of Jesus, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Because Jesus put on flesh, because Jesus lived life as a man, you and I can have confidence in Christ. Because of Christ, because of this Messiah, you and I may receive mercy and find grace in a time of need. But not only should we praise God, we also recognize that Jesus, in putting on flesh, fulfilled the promises of the coming Messiah. Before there was Isaac, before there was Jacob, before there was the nation of Israel, before there was King David, there was a man named Abraham, and a promise was made to him. In Galatians chapter 3, if you'd like to turn there, Galatians chapter 3, you can read in great detail about this promise. Verse 17 says, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say unto seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. The point of that verse is saying that, that there was a promise that was made to Abraham, and that promise was fulfilled in Christ. It goes on in the in coming verses, and it talks about how this promise that all the nations of the earth will be blessed, that Abraham would have descendants as many as the, the stars in the sky, as many as the, the sand on the, the seashore, that, 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 that his, in his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed, that you would be blessed through Abraham's seed was fulfilled through Christ. And this promise was made long before the law was made. Long before Moses stood upon Mount Sinai and received the Ten Commandments, and then they received many, many other commandments, long before those commandments came that the Jews put so much hope and so much uh, encouragement in, there came a promise 400 years before any of that. And it would be said in those verses that inheritance or being a child of God, being really who God wants us to be, is not because we follow a set of laws, but because of the promise that was made before those laws were created. In verses 26 and 27 of Galatians 3 it says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And then verse 29 says, And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. This promise that was made is fulfilled, is accomplished in the coming of Christ. Even a young Jesus, a, a young man, a Jesus at, at 12 years old, knew that his mission was to fulfill the will of his Father, was to do what God wanted him to do. He had a very specific mission. In Luke chapter 2 and verse 49, uh, after Mary and Joseph ha have lost Jesus, and you think about the, the irony of that, today we celebrate the fact that, that Jesus, the Son of God, God put on flesh, uh, the Messiah, we, we're recognizing that today, this, this morning, as we, we look at this in Scripture, um, they, they lost the Messiah. The most important man who's ever lived, his parents lose him. So, so parents, maybe that gives you a little bit of encouragement if you've ever made a mistake with, with your children. Uh, they, they've lost God in the flesh. Uh, and they find him finally in the temple. And it says in Luke 2.49, Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Jesus knew as a young man that he had to be about his father's business. At the end of that passage in Luke 2 verse 52 it says, And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Jesus grew up as a child. Do you remember what it was like to be a kid? Do you remember whatever age you are? Some of you are children, so, so you know exactly what it's like. But do you remember what it was like to, to be in, in, in middle school or in high school or even in college? Do you remember those days and the, the difficulties of, of trying to figure out who you were and, and trying to, to get along with, with other folks and, and having parents that, that told you what to do all the time? Jesus experienced all of those things. But he did it perfectly. And we surely know that we didn't do any of those things perfectly. Jesus lived that perfect life Jesus was dedicated throughout his life to bringing about his Father's will. I think that's most clearly seen in Luke chapter 22. Turn to Luke chapter 22. We'll read verses 39 through 46. In Luke 22 we find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is about to die. He's about to, to fulfill that ultimate promise of, uh, of being, being killed and being buried and being resurrected. He's, he's about to fulfill perform the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. 
Uh, Jesus is with his apostles, and they have they've walked out the uh, one of the gates of the, the city of, of Jerusalem, and they've walked uh, down the uh, across the, the Kidron Valley. Uh, the Kidron Valley was, was uh, Jerusalem sat upon a hill, and, and, and on the other side of the Kidron Valley is the Garden of Gethsemane where they're going. So they walk down uh, one slope of the valley, and they walk back up the other slope of the valley to get to the, the Garden of Gethsemane. This is Passover time. So in the, in the midst of Passover, thousands upon thousands of sacrifices are being made in the temple. And the blood from those sacrifices runs down a cauldron, and it eventually is emptied into the brook Kidron, which lies at the bottom of the Kidron Valley. There's not a direction that he could have gone without crossing over the brook Kidron at the bottom of the valley of, uh, of the Kidron Valley. And as he did so, he would have seen the blood stained, the, the water stained, the blood in the water. He would have recognized that. And he would recognize that these are the, the sacrifices that, that the people of God are making and have been making for, for year upon year, thousands and thousands, millions of sacrifices that have been made. And he's just moments away, hours away from being sacrificed as the ultimate Passover lamb. In Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 39, Luke 22, verse 39, And he, Jesus, came out and proceeded as was his custom to the Mount of Olives. And the disciples also followed him. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. And being in agony, he was praying with, fer with very fervently. And he, his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. When he rose from prayer, he came to his disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow and said to them, Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray so that you may not enter into temptation. In Matthew's account, we see that Jesus prays this same prayer or a prayer very similar to this three times. And each time he ends it, as we should end our prayers, at least in our mindset, as we should approach our life, at least in our mindset, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus only acted and only spoke according to what God directed him. You can read that in John 5, 19 and verse 12, chapter 12, verse 49. Jesus died so that God could raise him from the grave. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 54 through 57. Uh, speaking of the, the eventual res our eventual resurrection to heaven, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, starting. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable... And this mortal will have put on immortality. Then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. There were promises that were fulfilled. Promises made to Abraham, even promises made beyond that about uh, the, the fact that, that Satan would be defeated through the blood uh, of Jesus Christ. But let's notice lastly this morning, and most importantly, what was the prophet? What was the purpose? What was the reason that God put on flesh, that the Messiah came? It's twofold. First of all, the thing that we must be thankful for is, of course, our salvation. And we know this. We recognize this. Those of us who claim Christ, those of us who are trying to live life as Christians and who study God's Scripture, we, we recognize that salvation was the reason, was the purpose that Christ came. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 tells us, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone who's ever lived except for our Savior, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, all of us have sinned. That's what Romans 3.23 tells us, what we already know. Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin, what we deserve because of that sin, is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have eternal life because of Christ Jesus our Lord. Why did Jesus come? The most famous verse in all the world tells us that. A verse that is used by people who, who hardly can't claim Christianity at all, and maybe certainly don't live like Christians very often, they know this verse. John 3, 16. Why did Jesus come? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. We know that verse. Maybe we, we often even try to avoid that verse because so many other folks use that verse and, and then don't live the, the type of life that they should. 
in the same way, sometimes uh, some people argue that, you know, we, we shouldn't recognize or, or, or celebrate or talk about Jesus during this time of the year because so many other people talk about it this time of the year but don't talk about him any other time of the year. And, and that's true, and I, I can't deny that. But let's don't forget the fact that God sent his son to die for us so that we can have the hope of eternal life. Salvation hopefully is more important to us just than the, yeah, I'm saved and I don't really care about everyone else. Hopefully it's enough that we, we recognize that Jesus died for all people. What's the other purpose? I think in, in 1 Peter chapter 4, if you want to turn there, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, we see also that not only did Jesus come so that he could save us, he also say, came so that we could be his servants. 1 Peter 4, verses 10 and 11. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11 says this, as each one of us has received a gift. Now this could be talking about spiritual gifts. This could be talking about talents and abilities. But each one of us has received the gift, Romans 6, 23. The free gift of God is, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Go to your mom right now. I love her very much. <laughs> That's the first time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> thank you. All right. First Peter chapter four verses ten and eleven. So we have received a free gift. That was your gift for me today. Uh, <laughs> we have received that gift, right? The, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we're so thankful for that. And we need to be thankful for that. And we need to take advantage of the fact that people are thinking about that now, here, today, this 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 time of year. It says, as each of us have received a gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Whoever speaks is to do one is speaking the utterance of God. Whoever serves is to do one is serving by the strength which God supplies, so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom, to whom belongs the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Jesus didn't stay a baby. There, there, are, there are many people who are willing to celebrate the baby Jesus. There are far fewer who are willing to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The baby grew up. He lived perfectly. He died horribly. He resurrected miraculously. And he reigns victoriously. The question for you is, are you celebrating the baby Jesus? Or are you following the Lord Jesus? There were prophecies about him that were fulfilled. We should praise and glorify and celebrate the fact that God put on flesh. He fulfilled so many promises of God. He fulfilled the promise of God. But the question this morning is, not if God has done his part, but if you have done yours. Are you following daily Jesus the Christ, the Messiah who put on flesh lived perfectly, and died for you. Your Christianity is not about how good you are. Our Christianity is about how good our God is. And the fact that His Son died for us, was resurrected so that we could have the hope, and now is sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, waiting that day when God the Father will say to God the Son, Go. And that day is coming. Our question this morning is, are we ready for that? Do you have faith? Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says that we are saved by grace through faith. We must have that faith. We must be willing to repent of our sins. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, uh, we must be willing to deny ourselves and pick up our cross daily and follow Christ. That's the, the picture of repentance as we, we stop doing anything else other than following Christ. Whatever else we're doing outside of following Christ, we don't do that anymore. <coughs> we pick up our cross every day and we follow Christ. Are you willing to confess that with your mouth and with your actions every day of your life? Jesus says in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you deny me before men with your words or with your actions, I'll deny you before my Father who is in heaven. And are you willing to submit to baptism? Why? Because baptism is how you get into Christ. Romans chapter 6. And in Christ is where all spiritual blessings are. In Christ is being part of the body of Christ, being in the kingdom of Christ. And only those folks who are baptized into Christ will be in the kingdom of God in heaven one day for all eternity.
Today, again, around the world, there are those who recognize the birth of Christ. And it's a good thing to do. Not just on this day of the year. We should celebrate and remember the, the life of Christ. The, the birth of Christ is the beginning of that. We should recognize and celebrate and we're called to and commanded to commemorate the Lord's death until He comes through the Lord's Supper. But the point is that the biggest question the thing that I want to challenge myself with and challenge you with, whether you're, you're here every week and I know you perfectly or this is the first time you've ever seen me or I've ever seen you, is, not, is, is this. Are you following or are you celebrating the baby who laid in the manger or the Lord who died on the cross? Because it sounds kind of easy to follow the baby because babies, the baby can't really command you to do a whole lot of things. But that man who died for you on the cross, God who died for you on the cross, He demands your all. If you have faith in Him, you're willing to repent of your sins and confess Him as your Lord and submit to baptism. If you're not a Christian, you can become one now. And if you are a Christian, then you know the answer to that question. Are you following Jesus daily? Are you picking up that cross, the burden that it is to be a Christian, which is really pretty light, pretty easy? Are you being the Christian that God has called you to be? If you need help with that, that's what the church is for. If you're not a Christian and you want to study about that, we want to study with you about that. If you have any needs this morning, please come as we stand and sing.